follow along, all right? If you want to go back home and chew on this today, all right? And let's chew on it here. Psalms 85, the psalmist wrote, Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord. Grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what the God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people, but let them not return to their foolish ways. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, so our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful harvest. Righteousness goes as a herald before him, preparing the way for his steps. I was all set with a whole different message, people. <laughs> going into even yesterday. And yesterday about 11 o'clock, I'm going over it. It was polished really well. <laughs> It had something for everyone in it. And as I'm going through it, man, it just didn't feel like that's what was supposed to happen. And there wasn't anything wrong with the message. Lord willing, you'll hear it in time, okay? Nothing wrong with it. But God just laid something else on my heart. And so um, yesterday I sc scrapped that or filed that away and started it over, all right? That's a... Uh, no preacher likes to do that, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> you want the, the Spirit to have free reign, but man. So, here it is. You may or may not be aware, um, in Kentucky, a little town, there's been a revival that's been going on. It's been on the news, it's been on social media. And I don't have first-hand knowledge of anything, okay? I've watched some of it. I've, there was a documentary in the 1970s, a revival broke out there as well, and I watched that. Uh, but 10 days ago in their morning chapel session, after their morning chapel, as you know, a lot of Bible colleges, it's not a very big college, they have 1,700 students there. I think the town, I can't, what's the name of the town? Asbury. Well, that's the college, Asbury College. The town is, starts with a W. Willard. I can't. Yeah, Will it, Will it something. Yeah. And um, again, not, not many there. Uh, and... Uh, um, they had their chapel service, and after the chapel service, a group of students just gathered and just started praying. And what happened, um, and again, this is 10 days ago, it's still going, is that other students just started joining them, right? And they've just been in a time of worship and prayer and reading scripture for these last few days. People from all over the country and elsewhere, hundreds, maybe thousands, have all been flocking there, right, mm -hmm. to experience what's going on. And again, like I said, I have no firsthand knowledge of, of what's going on there. Clearly, God's doing something, and it's, you know, being called a revival. And, and let me just say, especially with us coming off the hills of what's, you know, happened at Michigan State, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like that's kept there alone, right? It's, it's happening all over our country. And, man, I welcome any revival anywhere, and hopefully that spreads, right? Because, obviously, our world, our campuses, our schools, our community, everything, we need Jesus, right? That's what we need. That's the only thing that's going to fix it. It's the only thing that's going to solve any of it yep. is Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, just so you know, I, I, I reached out to, to John, you know, John and Abby, and just told them, man, we're praying for you. And, you know, he works with... Uh, the crew at Michigan State and I just said look we're praying for you and I understand the tragedy but maybe God will use you use this to draw people to him right so we just want you to know man we're supporting you right and so you pray for, for John and Abby down there right they're in the thick of it right now but, and I hate the tragedy but what an opportunity right what an opportunity death does that right people death God knows how to get people's attention and sometimes it takes that right it may have taken that for you, somebody close to you, right? That's what it takes sometimes. I thought about all of this, and 
I thought about, you know, I'm humbled at the thought that God would bring revival. Not that he's not capable, especially as a preacher. Man, I've read all about revivals, all kinds of things and everything else. But, you know, I, I often wonder, have we as a country just gone too far? Right? Have we become, you know, like the Sodom and Gomorrah or days of Noah? Have we gone too wicked, too immoral, too violent? Right? Especially. That we're not going to see God's outpouring of mercy, but we're going to see his outpouring of wrath. Right? Because we're told it's going to get worse. We know that. Right? I was talking to me and you. We were talking, you know, it's, our, our country's just becoming desensitized to it. Right? Mm -hmm. That verse 6, Psalms 85, Psalms 85, 6, let's key in on that verse. Again, the psalm is crying out to God, won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? I'd like to rejoice, wouldn't you? What's revival? And why do I need it? That's what we're going to talk about today. What's revival and why do I need it? Now, I've got some of you, if you were grew up in church, or you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but when I think of revival, I go back to when I was a kid. The church I attended, we'd have a big revival in the fall. And it wasn't on the church property. It was actually across the street. There's a big hay field. And the men of the church would all gather. They'd spend a week or two. They would basically make a huge, almost like a pole bump, pole barn but it was made out of wood so big telephone poles for the uh, you know the support wood around it and then they would lay it was a brush arbor they would lay brush on the top of that roof and so my dad would go out there and help them I was a little kid I'd be out there you know while they're putting it all together thinking it's cool they put sawdust all down and they'd bring a hay wagon in and that served as the stage all right and they'd set up chairs, and, and it was a pretty big deal. I mean, we set up, you know, for hundreds of people, and it'd be packed, and there'd always be room for more. It was on a very busy highway. It was actually on part of Old Route 66 that runs through Springfield, Missouri. And um, there's a big flashing sign, Revival. And then a lot of people that drove through honking and saying all kinds of things that didn't seem like they wanted Revival. <laughs> But when I hear about that revival, I often go back to that. We would meet every night, 7 p.m., 14 nights. Sunday through Saturday, Sunday through Saturday. I wasn't very popular in school, guys. <laughs> I was at church. <laughs> but man, I loved it. It was awesome. They'd bring in special speakers, singers. That is just incredible. And there'd be some people that get saved. It would be awesome. So when I hear about revival, I often think back to that as a kid. Some of you may have memories of something similar to that, a tent revival, tent meeting, something like that. But revival doesn't happen by throwing it on the calendar. It's just not the way it works, right? As much as you want, that's not the way to renew Someone said revival is an invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. If you were singing it, Brother Rick was leading it, heaven come down. <laughs> you understand what that means, heaven come down. It's great in a lyric in a line, but understand what it means. When you invite heaven to come down, you're inviting yourself to be in the presence of God Almighty. And there's something that always happens when you're in his presence is that as we sing the last song, you fall down. Right? Right? Again, it's not a scheduled event. It can't be. I guess our flashing sign back when my kids should have been, we hope to have revival come tonight. <laughs> revival is a moving of people's hearts towards God and the things of God. Revival, and simple, the only way I can put it that's simple, revival is a moving of people's hearts towards God and the things of God. Why do I need it? Why do you need it? Well, I've been a believer for a long time. Well, I promise you, you need it. <laughs> I haven't been a believer very long. I promise you need it. I'm not even a believer. I know you need it. <laughs> There's a story. A visitor went to a church out west. There's a big banner. 
big orange and red flames of fire, and on it said, Come, Holy Spirit, hallelujah. <laughs> Great. And man, if, that, if a banner gets it done, I'm, let's have a banner. But the person that put the banner up wasn't paying attention because they put it on the wall right above another sign that said fire extinguisher. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I think we often live our lives with the Holy Spirit within us as a believer extinguished. Right? If God would let us see what he sees, What would he see? And are you sure that you want heaven to come down and show you? Right. It scares me. I'm sure it scares you too. If we could get a glimpse of what God sees, is there even a fire or a flicker, smoldering flame? What's there? What's God see when he looks at our life and our heart? I know it's not lawn mowing season I was teased a little bit last week not that I was going to get the mower out but I just you know <laughs> thought man that church is almost tall enough to at the church to, to mow I may have to call Phil and say Phil <laughs> had no push mower once and it just would have a hard time starting and once I got it started you know it smoke would billow out and it kind of sputtered but it worked and um and I decided one day, I finally like, okay, I'm going to take the time and figure out what's wrong with this thing. You know, there's not a lot to them. And I took out the spark plug, and any of you, you know, you don't have to be much of a mechanic, but the spark plug, where it's supposed to spark, wasn't sparking. That's a problem for a spark plug, people. <laughs> its whole purpose is to spark. <laughs> and it was just half-heartedly doing its job because there was carbon built up. It was all black, right? Carbon's the, the, the technical term. Crud is the layman's term. There's a bunch of crud on it. Clean the crud off and man, work like a charm. Psalms 85, 8. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people, but let them not return to their foolish ways. What are our foolish ways that we're not to return to? Whatever puts out the spark, in a nutshell. Whatever creates the crud that builds up in your and my life. It's, that's sin, obviously. Sin, crud in our lives, clogs the working of the Holy Spirit. Sin in your and my life clogs, corrodes, crud's up, however you want to say it, God's Holy Spirit working in my life and in your life as a believer. Sin is a Holy Spirit fire extinguisher. But listen, praise God, the Holy Spirit does not want to be extinguished. John 16, 8, I hope it's up here. Jesus said, when he comes, talking about the Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and God's righteousness and the coming judgment. My old lawnmower, it would have been great if I would have walked out there, saved me a lot of time, full spark liquid, and said, I'm the problem. <laughs> I have the Holy Spirit in me that says, hey, I know the problem, and it's not me. You've let crud build up. You know, if you don't do a spiritual checkup every now and then, the crud builds up, right? I had mowed part of my lawn with that little push mower sputtering and blowing smoke for a while. One, just laziness to tear it apart. <laughs> Didn't take a lot. Once I did what I needed to do, it worked. You know, we often live with our spiritual lives sputtering. Right? Sputtering. On life, on Holy Spirit life support. <laughs> Why hasn't God answered my prayer? Why is it I seem to have lost my joy? Have you ever, just be honest, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or anything, but have you ever just, in your week, just something, you've just lost the joy and there's really no reason for it? Mm -hmm. Feeling a little melancholy for some reason? Just, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Why is it that I as a believer feel hopeless, helpless, aimless? As if it's gotten to a point where I say, what's the point? Why am I even here? Right? Ever felt that? As a believer, you felt that. The Holy Spirit living inside of you. Why could you ever feel that way? Now listen, this isn't a, an accusatory, this isn't a judgment message, all right? It's not my job to convict. That's Holy Spirit's job. Huh. I'm glad that's his life, our attitude, right? Our family, our friends, our witness, our testimony, right? The words we say, thoughts we have. We lose that clean connection flowing of the Holy Spirit freely working in our lives. And so what do we do? Well, our sins need to be confessed. Not to a human man, right? But to God the Father, who you, as a believer, have direct access through Jesus Christ. What's, what's the Bible say? Come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. Boldly to the throne of grace. When you and I as a believer sin, you know, look, you know, when you get saved, does that stop you from being a sinner? No, you're still a sinner, but you've been redeemed, right? Redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ that gave his life as a sacrifice for you. So you will stand in heaven, not worthy of your own, because you did nothing for it. You simply received the free gift of salvation to stand there and say, I'm one of yours, Right? I'm not here. I didn't get here by my own merits. Because you and I can't be good enough. It's only by his grace through our faith that we've been saved, right? So you come to God and you say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for sin. Sometimes you come to God and you don't even know there's sin there. You say, God, maybe there's someone. God, maybe I'm doing something I don't even realize is wrong. Can that happen? Of course it can. Of course it can. <clears throat> You know, sometimes what happens is when you draw away from God, you're less likely to recognize the things that are against God. And then as you draw closer, he reveals things to you. That's why, look, at you can take any believer, and I promise you, the closer and closer they get to God, the more inadequate they feel in his presence. Right? Isaiah 59, 2 says this. Look at this. Because again, sin's going to take away the spark. Sin will quench the Holy Spirit's working. Isaiah 59, 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It's not my words. It's God's words. He gave it to the prophet Isaiah. You can't dance around that. There cannot be sin and the Holy Spirit have its full effect. There cannot be sin and God hear from heaven. Does he hear the prayer? Yes. Does he act on the prayer? No. If I go to God in complete, humble, and genuineness, does he hear my prayer? Yes. Will he act the way I want him to? I don't know. Because it still comes down to his will. But at least I've come to him with a heart that's genuine, right? And repentant before him. What do we do? Well, let me give you the verses, Psalms 51. Here we, we flip to Psalms 51. David wrote, After his sin with Bathsheba, the adulterous affair, and the murdering her husband. All right? So let's just make it plain and clear what happened. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey. Make me willing to obey. Listen, you need revival because your sin erodes your willingness to obey. That's what happens. Sin, crud in your life, it, it just causes you to not be obedient to the Lord. It drives you from Him rather than to Him. You can't follow him and not be in step with him. Didn't we lead the whole service with in his steps? I told you we'd get back to that. Your purpose, my purpose, you and I as believers, is to worship him, 
serve him and obey him. I can make it real simple. I, you know, that we could just, every week, the same message. And, and ultimately, I hate to give it away, that's really what it is. If you want to boil all the messages down every week, you're going to hear from me at least. It's worship him, serve him, obey him. All right. I just, you know, whatever. I don't. Yeah, it does. What Jesus, two things he said. Two things he said, right? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, right? Other uh, uh, gospels add strength, right? Heart, soul, mind, strength. And what gets overlooked in that verse, I don't even think the verse is going to be up there for you, but it says you must love the Lord your God. He's not your God if you don't love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, people. You can't call him Lord. He goes on, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. What's the second commandment, people? What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Listen, I'm here because God wants me to love, serve, and obey him with every breath he gives me while I'm here. And it's the same for you. As long as God has you here, with every breath he gives you, you're to love him, serve him, and be willing to be obedient to him. You don't have to chase some dream, people. It, that's it. You wouldn't think the purpose could be boiled down so simply, but Jesus did it. <laughs> we go through this life, we get tired, we get run down, we get beat down, put down, and look, we lose focus. We lose focus on what it's all about. Our focus shifts. We start getting, you know, all that stuff, what happens is we kind of retreat to ourselves, and we just become self-centered, rather than him-centered, others-focused, right? That's what happens, right? You all, you, you know, you come home from work and we, you can't wait to be in, right? Not only do we take them out of priority in life, but when we do that, we naturally get out of whack with that second thing, which again is to love others because we're too focused on us. And God who created us, listen, God's not ignorant of our ways. Thank goodness. He made us. He created us not to be that way, but he knows that's the way we would become. He understands it, not as an excuse, but Psalms 85, 6 and 7, again, look back at that. Parker, if you can cue in those verses, 6 and 7 of 85. Won't you revive us again as your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Listen, is that written only for the Jew? Only the, the, the readers of that time of the song? No. I mean, if you believe, follow with me on this track. If you believe God's word is inspired, that it was breathed from God, do you believe that? I'm not just looking for a yes or an amen. If you don't believe, then don't, you don't have to, don't answer. You're wrong, but that's okay. We'll let the people that agree. Do you believe that God breathed his word out and inspired men to write the word of God? All right. Do you believe that God's word, the 66 books, Genesis to Revelation, has been preserved by God? Yes. All right. We're all on the same page. I want you to think about this then. In knowing that, then understand that the God who before the foundation of the world knew that those words would be declared to you today, these verses, Psalms 85, Psalms 51, he knew you and I'd be talking about it, and I didn't even know it yesterday until 11 o'clock. Right? Does God want you revived? Does God want you to rejoice? Do you think God wants you to see and experience his unfailing love? Listen, I'm not talking about an emotional frenzy. I mean, that's great too, but I'm talking about something that's undeniable from God. Right? Does God want you to receive his salvation? Of course. We need revival. We need revival. And let me just interject here. Um, I, 
I was kind of excited what was going on down there. I wanted to check it out. Me, Rebecca, Isaac, we were all going to head there tomorrow afternoon, spend the night, and go to Asbury College. And, and you know, I wanted to be in the auditorium where it's happening, not an open flow room. You know, somehow, some way, I was going to make myself in, just see for myself what's happening here. But they've kind of, they've kind of changed format, and uh, they don't have the night, se night sessions just for students right now. The part of me is envious, jealous, like, well, I'm glad it's happening there, don't get me wrong, but I, I'd like in on that. I mean, do we just not get it because we're seven hours away, 452 miles? Because we don't have a college sitting here on these five acres of land, do we not get it? I mean, do, are we not allowed to have a revival? Yeah. Psalms 139, 23. Look at this. Psalms 139, 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. That's a dangerous verse, people. Be careful. It sounds really good at first. But let's be honest. One of the things that keeps you from pouring or from revival being poured out in your life, my life, is that you don't want God to know what you're thinking. You don't want God to know the crud. That's right. He knows. Or who are we fooling? You think God doesn't know? But you also don't want to admit it. And you sure don't want anybody else to know. What you don't even want to admit yourself. Right? We need revival because, listen, sin gets in. It affects our love for God. It affects the Holy Spirit's flow working in us from God, and it affects our love for others. We're to love God and love others. Does it say anywhere in Scripture that you and I as a believer are here to make as much money as possible? <laughs> uh, you're not going to find it, people. It's not in here. Does it say anywhere in Scripture that you and I are here to hoard as many possessions as possible? It's not there. I think it actually talks against that. Does it say anywhere in Scripture that you and I are just here to want what we want? Does it say anywhere in Scripture that we're just here to be entertained? Solomon entertained himself, right? 700 wives, 300 concubines. Not counting all the money in the world, the most beautiful of everything. Wisest person. How did the wisest person end with his life being a tragedy? As a believer. Because sin got in. Sin got in. No one's exempt from it, people. No one's exempt from it. Someone said revival is the church falling in love with Jesus all over again. Pretty simple. It's falling in love with Jesus all over again. Someone said in revival, the minds of people are concentrated upon things of eternity, and there's an awareness that nothing else really matters. Listen, when you experience revival, personal, as a church body, some things are going to happen. I read earlier that Psalms 51.10, David wrote, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Other translations, right spirit. Loyal spirit, right spirit. That loyal, right spirit is loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Putting Him first and then allowing Him through you to love others. Psalms 51.11 says, Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I want you to understand, that's not about a believer losing salvation, people. It's about losing the power of the Holy Spirit filling you with his power to work. Say the Holy Spirit resides in you. But that's different from being filled. Oh, Chris, come on up here, Brother Chris. Listen, you're filled when he has control. Think about this. As a believer, God promises you, look, I'm leaving. I'm going to send another, the comforter, right? 
We know after Pentecost, he began, in the Old Testament times, he came upon people in instances when God's power needed to be displayed. Christ went to the cross, buried, died, resurrected, ascended. When he went after Pentecost, then the Holy Spirit began to indwell us as believers. And we're promised throughout many verses of Scripture that you and I have the Holy Spirit living within us. But imagine having the Holy Spirit living in us, but not having control of us. Us not being in step with the Spirit. It's like it's he's being quenched. Right? Tampered down. The fire's there. But it's like we're putting a, a blanket of crud on it. Right? Psalms 51, 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Make me willing to obey you. Notice that verse. You get the joy when you obey. You want the joy. You guys love the first part of that verse. Give me the joy. Joy, 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 joy down in my heart. God says I will, will, will when you obey me with your heart. You want the joy, obey him. Then there's joy. Listen, until you live surrendered to the Lord, he isn't Lord. And you can't experience the joy without obeying Him. And you may need this morning to just cry out and say, Lord, make me willing to obey you. It goes on to say, I won't spend time on it. Psalms 51, 13 says, Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. You know what happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you? You can't contain it. And other people are drawn to Him. Reflected through you as a result of it. Because guess what? God not only loves you, but he, you know why he wants you to love others? Because he loves them too. And that's why he wants you. To show you that he loves you and show you that he loves others too. We're going to do something a little bit different. I don't want you to be freaked out. The video is going to go off. This isn't going to be televised. Sorry if you're online. Listen, you know what you need to do, right? We've got chairs up here. We don't really have, we're not a church, it's not big enough.